Welcome everyone to our latest episode of Wheels Up, Future of Flight. I am your host, Jessica Kinman, and with me is my co-host, Alex Ramirez. We did not coordinate shirts today. We just happened to both be wearing black, so completely not scheduled at all. <laughs> so if you haven't joined us before, uh, what we focus on is electrification, global urgency on sustainable solutions. We talk about digital connected infrastructures and rapidly advancing novel technologies, which have ushered aerospace into the next exciting period of innovation, arguably not experienced since the dawn of aviation. Today, we are joined by Boeing Director of Engineering for Urban Air Mobility, Rami Morad. Rami holds an aeronautical and astronautical engineering degree, so much complicated than just a regular ME like I have, <laughs> from Purdue University. I'm supposed to spike in their gold boilermakers, Ooh, so I'm boy. sure we'll hear a little bit more about that later. <laughs> and he spent his entire career working on the frontiers of novel technology in both commercial and defense aerospace. He's worked from light jets to optionally piloted helicopters to the 787 and KC-46 tanker, which I'm familiar with both of those. And he has more than 15 years of experience in engineering and program management across the entire product development life cycle. He's got a deep passion for all things aerospace, which we'll be talking about, and he believes the industry is on the cusp of the next technical, technological revolution. They'll make aerial travel available to the majority of civilization, which I am excited to see how that can start being incorporated into my daily life, because like anyone else here, I am not a big fan of driving to SeaTac. <laughs> he is also a champion for diverse, collaborative, and innovative team cultures in pursuit of that future. Currently at Boeing, Rami currently serves as the Director of Engineering for Urban Air Mobility, providing engineering oversight and support to WISC Aero, which is Boeing's advanced air mobility subsidiary, which are developing the first autonomous electrical vertical takeoff and landing air taxi in the U.S. In addition to SkyGrid, a joint venture with Smart Cognition, who has developed the world's first airspace management system powered by AI and blockchain to provide an end-to-end -end solution to monitor the airspace as well as execute the optimal and safe flight patterns for drones, air taxis, and other unmanned, unmanned aircraft. Basically, to summarize that up, we're going to talk about everything from how the UAVs are going to how we're going to coordinate traffic and air traffic control when we start throwing a whole bunch of stuff up in the air. So thank you for joining us, Rami. I will hand it over to Alex to get us going. What an introduction. Thank you, Rami, so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to be talking to you and everything that you and your team at Boeing are doing to really transform the industry, right? It is, uh, I love the way you put it, it is a uh, technological revolution that's happening and and uh, to see all the, the work that you and your team is doing is excited and happy to share or excited to see what you have to share with us today. So uh, I had the privilege of being present for your presentation earlier this year at uh, the uh, Vertical Flight Society, VTOL Summit in Mesa. And one of the things that really struck me was the way that you opened the presentation, right? You said, what a time to be alive in our industry. And then you put up a, a beautiful picture of your daughter standing next to Amelia in Hart's airplane. And you went on to talk about, you know, where the industry is and, and where it's going. Can you share a little bit about what prompted that heartwarming moment and kind of what, you know, what you're seeing of where we're at and where we, we want to go? Good, Alex. Hey, thanks, Alex and Jessica, for having me. It's great to talk to you today. Um, hey, and thanks for the chance to, to have a proud dad moment to kick things off. That's a, a really awesome question. Um, one of the best parts about being a parent, I think, is seeing the, wor the world through the lens of a child again. Uh, I have three kids uh, with, my, uh, with my amazing wife, Dahlia. Uh, we have two six-year-old boys, uh, twins, Alex and Marcus, and an eight-year-old girl, Amelia. Um, Dahlia and I actually met, speaking of Purdue, at, uh, at our last year in aero engineering at Purdue and decided to name uh, our daughter after Amelia Earhart based on all of uh, uh, Earhart's significant contributions to our alma mater and uh, aviation and women in engineering. So um, we're, we're uh, proud and honored for uh, the opportunity to, to name uh, our daughter after Amelia Earhart. And I think she's pretty excited about it too. So the picture that you're referring to um, was taken at the Museum of Flight during COVID. And uh, we were walking through the museum as a family 
uh, and uh, it, that was Amelia posing in front of Earhart's uh, Electra, actually, that was a fun part of the, the museum, but we observed how many different types of older airplanes there are, and, and the kids noticed that, right? So uh, we took some time to imagine what would it be like to live through the early days of aviation, and I think it's a very uh, sobering perspective when we think about it. So um, here, let's do it together. Uh, if Amelia was seven years old, when the Wright Flyer made its first powered flight in 1903, she would have been old enough to mesmerize at this idea that humans can fly like birds. I think that's old enough to kind of get that, a, a timeless human fantasy, right, at the time, I'm sure. Um, and this is, imagine 1903 was a time when the automobile, the car, was still not mainstream. It was just getting going. There was hardly a road system in place at all. So that's that's the childhood that she she would have known, right? She would have grown then to see airplanes become used as uh, in practical settings, as mail carriers, then to connect people. Um, she would have seen the role that airplanes played during the World Wars. Uh, she grew. She would have grown into adulthood, um, uh, seeing airplanes basically starting to be used to transport people. And eventually she would be an adult during the jet age. And uh, it's likely that she would have been able to afford her first flight, probably in her fifties with her own children. But could you imagine how moving that moment would have been to see the, the ground pass by at hundreds of miles an hour, you know, traveling hundreds of miles in less than a day. And in her childhood, that wouldn't have been possible. It, I imagine that would have been a truly moving experience um, for, for humans and, and adults at that time. Uh, eventually, uh, she would have grown up to see uh, us break the sound barrier and create these amazing flying machines. And in her 70s, probably watching on TV with her grandkids, she would have seen a human being leave Earth, land on the moon, and come back to Earth, all in a single lifetime. And, and I think when we reflect just in that lifetime, the rate of innovation, it's just truly remarkable what, what we achieved in, in a very short amount of time. Um, so that brings us to the 70s, um, 1903 to 1969. Since the 70s, we've had perhaps fewer revolutionary moments in the sense of new aircraft, new types of aircraft, major milestones like that, but we focused really hard on scaling this industry in a really incredible way. Uh, we focused on safety, efficiency, reliability, creating an ecosystem uh, to support that scale. And, uh, and I'm proud that I'm part of Boeing, which really led the way to create this safest transportation system at a remarkable scale. Like today, we fly over 4 billion passengers a year, 45 million flights a year. Uh, it's just, un, it, it's, it kind of makes the, the hair on the back of your neck stand up when you think about how big that is and the safety record that this industry has established as foundational. Um, so, you know, today flying is pretty mainstream for us. We don't even worry about it. When we get on an airplane, we worry about when is Wi-Fi going to be turned on? So that, that theme of safety, um, I think it, we'll talk about that a lot here uh, in, in our time together is a very firm foundation that cannot change. The public expects that. Uh, and the scale and the safety record that we've achieved uh, is a remarkable human achievement and it's, it's baseline, that, that can't waver. Um, but even still, at the scale we talk about, only 20% of the world has experienced the joy of flight. Uh, and so we have an opportunity today in this moment uh, to create a more accessible, a more sustainable, uh, uh, scaled version of our industry. And I think that opportunity is really rich. I, I think we're on the cusp of an innovation rate that is similar, if not even higher than the early days of aviation. Uh, and I think about it in every aspect. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about electrification and, and autonomous small aircraft creating a new market, but the same applies to space travel, uh, large scale commercial aviation, defense applications, uh, right, right now, we're experiencing this convergence of technologies, societal norms, uh, business models, and, and expectations globally around sustainability that I think is driving um, a collaboration across industry that we haven't seen in decades. So, it, you know, there's a lot more tech 
that you know that that shows up in our in our industry than uh, that I think we've seen in decades. So uh, electrification, for example, uh, that simplifies aircraft design substantially, and it really puts us from a sustainability um, on a path to that 2050 goal of a net zero carbon emission in aviation. It gives us a great experience with what uh, battery electric could do for us. Uh, the digital infrastructure, um, that's really uh, an opportunity for us in terms of a transformational future of, of, of uh, airspace management and how we develop new products, uh, new engineering in our, uh, in our digital space with virtual machines, uh, the modeling and simulation capability we have today, model-based systems engineering. And I think the key to unlock um, accessibility of, of aerospace uh, and a whole new level is autonomy. I think the autonomy now is uh, is going to be a theme for the next 100 years of a aviation. We'll talk a lot more about that, but I think it has the potential to change operational viability, um, the whole economics of, of our field. So I just think we're really lucky, and the story of, of Amelia, you know, is, is to say we're in a time now that we're going to see that same revolutionary change that we fantasized about in the early days of aviation. So she's eight today. And I, I think just like at the at, in the story where she probably couldn't have imagined a human being leaving Earth in 1903, I think she's going to experience air mobility in ways we haven't imagined today in her lifetime. And, and I just think that's uh, really special that we get to be a part of that time. Wow, what a what an opening there. Thanks, Rami. That's a, a <laughs> lot of exciting stuff that's going on and this vision right of, of where we're at and where we're going. Um, and also the, you know, the passion that you have for the industry. And I think, you know, the, the folks that you get to meet that work in the industry and get to work on these hard, you know, very difficult problems. Um, do you have any inspiration or like any words of wisdom for aspiring engineers that want to go? This is near and dear to my heart. I just went to my, my niece's graduation, high school graduation two weeks ago, and she wants to be an engineer and, and, you know, trying to tell her, Hey, look, we need more diversity. We need more, you know, leaders in the industry. Um, with all of this change, you know, there's just so any anything you have to say or, or anything to inspire folks out that may be thinking about STEM or maybe thinking about, you know, uh, pursuing a career in engineering and, and aerospace. Sure. Yeah, thanks. You know, the funny thing is I didn't even get the bug for aviation until relatively, relatively late in my academics. Um, I decided to st study aerodynamics at Purdue because I wanted to design race cars, <laughs> fast cars. Uh, it wasn't until I had an internship at uh, Eclipse Aviation that I, I truly fell in love with aviation. I, I saw the the flight test team having a ton of fun and asked how I could join them. Um, they, they they said they'd give me a shot if I got my pilot's license. So I went back and uh, got my pilot's license. In fact, my my good friend, uh, Cyrus Cigar, he was the first to uh, give me my very first uh, instructed flight. Uh, and I and I just got the bug, you know, working at uh, the experience I had in that internship and um, just experiencing the joy of flight. Uh, so to to my colleagues around the industry, just a, a quick comment on the importance of um, the roles that that, that interns, internships play in people's livelihoods. It could really make or break. Uh, that is a very very influential moment. And my my best advice to employers is. Treat your interns uh, the same way as you would engineers, their, their peer engineers. Give them the same responsibilities and assignments, of course, with oversight. Um, but that makes a big difference because uh, it, it certainly did for me. And I, uh, I have a lot of gratitude for um, those that influenced me in my early, early career. Here's what I'll say to aspiring engineers. Um, there's, there's a beauty about flight that humans have appreciated for as long as we've observed birds, right? But not everybody has that bug. And, and that's totally cool. And aerospace products today, I think require every single type of engineering. There's more lines of code today on an airplane than you can count. Um, there are new materials, there's new design methods, manufacturing methods, propulsion options, energy management systems, uh, uh, production system automation, the demands of sustainability is driving us to think about things differently, you name it, so on, it, it goes, the list goes on. Um, and, and I don't care who you are, when you get to contribute some engineering creation to an aircraft, the first time you see it fly is a memory that you'll carry forever. It's a very special feeling. Uh, it, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, 
So my the advice I'd offer to, to aspiring uh, engineers is obsess about uh, continued learning over all else. Uh, there's a magical moment happening right now. Take don't take it for granted. Not just in aerospace, really in all uh, technical fields. You see it all around. It's really amazing. Um, you're starting your career at an extraordinary time, extraordinary era of innovation. If you're thirsty to learn more about what interests you and you have the courage to take risks, uh, especially early on, the rest is going to fall in place. And and just don't get distracted by other things. I think the happiest and most successful engineers I know uh, are the ones who focus on self-improvement and increasing their knowledge uh, every day for their own satisfaction. Uh, there's plenty of us to do in the coming uh, decades in our industry. So I think people entering their careers now are in a very uh, lucky moment here. Awesome. I think that's kind of interesting. You kind of touch on two ways to get people excited, right? So targeting current engineers and what direction they want to go once they realize, oh, I want to be an engineer. Now what? Um, but like your reference of, you know, your your photo with your daughter starting early is is another one that a lot of people don't think about when, when you were talking about that i was just sitting here laughing because the one picture i have in my house is me and my sister in front of one of the first 747s like oh, she's so one cool. i'm three they have us dressed up in this little usa outfit you know and to, to your point i remember driving on the flight line outside of it and seeing the aircraft and the takeoffs and how awesome that was and like you said, just opening it up and realizing what you see in a generation, how much we change, like even starting small. It's like, I didn't realize I was going to start working at Boeing or start getting into, you know, sending rockets up with other space companies. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think that's another point, like start early, expose your kids, expose other people's kids to being an engineer. It's kind of cool. We're not just nerdy people, you know, with a little projector in our pocket. Um, we're actually doing very impactful things into innovation today um so yeah i think both of those both of those levels are really important oh i love that story jessica you know and we're working at brook boeing uh there's no shortage of products to be proud of or to, to experiment with early in your career everything from space to big airplanes small airplanes defense all these different uh options to um to be a part of um but your point about starting early you know the childhood thing our industry uh, still has uh, it, it's, it's very imbalanced when it comes to underrepresented communities. Uh, everything from women to uh, various racial classes, and I think we can dramatically improve the diversity of perspective uh, in in our field here in in aerospace engineering or just creating airplanes and creating uh, flying vehicles, and that. That really starts by making it obviously normal as children, not, oh, that's a boy thing, or I'm not smart enough, or whatever. Um, that that has to happen early. One of my favorite things to do in the summer is uh, like boys and girls summer camps, where just talking to kids about uh, what we're doing and making it real that it's possible for them, regardless of their background or where they come from, it's possible for them to play a significant role. We can all do that. Like that doesn't take anything extra or special to have that conversation. Uh, and it is hugely rewarding. It's just very, very rewarding to, to have that impact on uh, 10, to, 10 to 18 year olds. It's just very influential moment. So speaking of impact, uh, Rami, aerospace is one of those industries, right, where we're constantly trying to defy what sometimes feels just humanly possible, right? Whether it's, again, you know, first flight or sending somebody to the moon, and now the things that are happening in the industry, that can't be done, as you just said, without diversity, without collaboration, without, um, you know, it, it's so hard, though, with all these moving parts, all the complexity that's going, can you give your perspective on some of the challenges to harmonize, for example, regulation, right? All these regulatory bodies that have, you know, uh, per, uh, differentiating perspectives on, you know, what what the standard should be, eco, you know, the ecosystems for infrastructure. Um, you know, we ultimately all need to be coming together globally, right? To make this vision that you talk about reality, but it's gonna be a challenge to get there and it's gonna take a while. I mean, can you, can you give your perspective on some of the challenges and, and maybe some of the things that you're 
particularly um, inspired by that you're seeing as, as far as trends and, and communities? Oh, Alex, I love that question. Uh, I'll start by challenging the notion that regulation implies uh, there's going to be somehow innovation impeded. Uh, I, I think that's uh, it's a common it's a common thought many have, but I, I believe it's a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. I think regulation is what has allowed us to scale the industry to the numbers I just talked about. Um, many in, in the early days would have considered the safety record we have today impossible. But the fact that we connect that many people around the globe, so um, so efficiently, so safely, is a uh, is a human achievement that was enabled by regulation. So our regard for human life as a society, as a global society, is I think what set the bar for these aviation standards. And our commitment to that can't waver. Full stop. That's just basic. So I I actually think the checks and balances are good for innovation. I although there is bureaucracy, it's not a battle. Um, we've got mutual respect for the roles that the innovators and regulators play um, to keep the industry moving forward and serving humanity in a beneficial way. Um, but I think it's good that the bar for safety and the bar for entry is high uh, and that it requires extremely thorough safety case analysis throughout the entire uh, safety continuum from product development through operations. Um, regarding standards, I it's actually very encouraging to see what's happening today from my perspective in the standards development uh, organization in the sector. The, the right debates uh, are happening across our industry, uh, especially when it comes to airspace integration. And, and I think the ball is moving forward, uh, but those debates are critically important. Uh, I don't see it stopping innovation. You can look around, look at how many people and companies are creating right now. I believe that uh, that innovation is actually fueled by constraints. I think there's a respect for the basic constraints we all have to adhere to. If we were to relax those constraints, we would start seeing catastrophic or fatal events, and that would destroy innovation. That would stop it. Um, so, you know, I'll talk about a little bit about the team at WISC, and I know we're gonna get into this more later, mm -hmm. but WISC is actively developing uh, literally a self-flying passenger carrying uh, uh, electric air, airplane and an air taxi. And we see a path to certification and working with the regulators has been a very positive experience. Um, WISC has an active today type certificate project number with the FAA. And I believe, I'm not a percent sure, but I believe it's the first time in history that there's been a, a, a type certificate application for an autonomous passenger carrying airplane. That's pretty cool. Uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of people will ask me, uh, if I worry about public adoption of, of such technology. Uh, and, you know, actually, at first, I, I started to think that way. But after living in this for a bit, I'm starting to realize something. And actually, we might all notice this, too. I'm not worried about public adoption. I, I think that the societal norms today have, uh, and the current generation, future generations, have plenty of early adopters of, of new technologies. I actually think once this becomes available, uh, to to people, there's going to be lines around the block, you know, for the first for the first operations. Um, so I, I'm not worried about that. What worries me um, a lot more is public retraction after an accident. If the flying public um, holds us to this level, this standard, this very high bar, what they're normal, what they're used to in terms of air travel, uh, sees a a an event like that. Um, they're not going to differentiate. That's going to be a significant, there's going to be a significant reaction to that. And rightfully so. And, and so um, I think an event in this space could set the entire industry back. And that's the real threat to, to innovation. Um, so, so to protect innovation, we really have to adhere, I think, to the highest safety standards. It's not an or, it's an and. Uh, and it's, it's not easy. It requires extremely thorough analysis of every function we design. Uh, the regulator's job is to enforce that, and, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, and I'm very confident that our rate of innovation will, will only increase because of it. The technologies and the convergence of what I described, the societal norms of all the business benefits 
that's what's fueling it and and will continue to push us forward in that uh, in that regard. So um, I think early adopters and and starting to put this uh, into motion is going to build the data that creates the momentum and the um, the credibility of of the operations at scale, and then that'll fuel the follow on adopters and we'll build on that and then we continue to innovate right rinse and repeat. So Rami, you, you brought up WISC, so let's let's talk WISC, right? Uh, number one, congratulations on you know the big announcement here a couple of weeks ago of WISC becoming a fully owned subsidiary by the Boeing Company. That's uh, that's big news. We'll, we'll skip the question on whether that was you're doing or not. So we'll, we'll leave that for another conversation. Um, but you know, and you touched on it. I think you know there's been a lot of conversation on in the industry around hey, is is going autonomous flight a leap too far, right? Compared to what other air taxi companies are doing in the industry that require pilot uh, first. Can you share, you know, the strategy behind that and why uh, WISC and the Boeing company, you know, behind WISC it, it chose that route um, as opposed to some of the others in, in the industry? Um, yes, uh, and thanks for that question. I, I'll touch on the the acquisition for just a second. It was certainly not my, well, well above me. Uh, but uh, I want to compliment our JV partner, Kitty Hawk, um, on the role they played in, in pioneering the space with WISC. Uh, now we're entering that certification and manufacturing phase. Uh, and so having that uh, partnership with Boeing uh, in a strategic and a financial way is, is very good for the mission. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to, to uh, give kudos where it's due. Uh, I also want to recognize that our peers in the industry that are introducing AAM uh, with piloted solutions are doing very hard work, good work, and and I'm rooting for we're rooting for them. I, I think it's it's good it's good for us when they succeed. I think it's good for them when we succeed. So it's it's not a uh, I don't think it's a it's an us versus them kind of situation. I think there's an evolution that's happening here that's good and necessary. Um, and, and there's an appropriate place with the entries that are happening for the industry to start and all boats will rise in the tide. Um, at WISC, and, and this is the reason Boeing uh, very much uh, fell in love with WISC, is th there's this belief that autonomy is the safest scalable solution and we ought to go straight for it because it's going to be hard and it's going to take some effort, some time to get there. Um, but we believe we're confident that we can do that. And we want our focus to be on that safest scalable solution. Um, automation has, you know, autonomy is one of those words that has a, a large spectrum of meaning. Um, but automation has played a really important role in making aviation safer and safer right, to, to the standards we have, to the uh, record we have today. Flight decks are highly automated. Uh, to help reduce pilot workload and, and to augment the human in the loop. Um, actually, Brian uh, Yuko, uh, the CEO of WISC, just gave a podcast where he talks about demystifying autonomy. And he, I think he does a really eloquent job in that, um, talking about uh, how autonomy can be perceived versus what we're actually doing. And I want to reference something he said. He, you know, Because autonomy can have such a broad meaning, um, some will imagine this you know, this uh, all-knowing AI making decisions about where our planes are going to fly and they can let, take off and land anywhere. This idea that uh, I can get picked up in Times Square and dropped off in my backyard um, and a lot of these decisions happening on their own. That, that's, that's not what we're talking about. With WISC, we're, we're talking about something that's much, much more focused. And Brian describes it like uh, it's like a gondola where it takes off from a precisely controlled location it flies a controlled route, very known and rep repetitive, uh, and it lands at another precisely controlled location. And along the way, um, we know where there are places for the airplane to safely land if it needs to. And so imagine this point A to point B, back to A, back to B, and it's, it's, almost, it's almost boring in a good way uh, in, in, in how the, the, the system is very simply set up to be um, proactively and con uh, very controlled and, and separated. Um, I think it's important also to note that in this scenario, uh, oh, the human doesn't go away. The human is just doing uh, different things. 
So uh, we're going to get into it probably a little bit more as we talk here, but here the, the, the human will continue to play a very important role, which what we're very good at is judgment and, and providing a supervisory role. And in this case, it's going to be on the ground while the airplane flies that very precise and controlled repetitive route again and again. <laughs> so um, this is the system that we believe will allow us to safely scale uh, our operations. And the decision to focus on the solution is um, is really the reason that 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 attracted Boeing uh, to WISC, one of the reasons. So we know it's a big step. Uh, we believe the path to get there is very doable when you break it down into the specific functions uh, and the, the hardware and software that we're going to build. There is a certification set of standards that we uh, uh, follow for each function where we will describe how we satisfy the safety levels uh, necessary, how we attribute the safety levels that are required. Um, and, and we will follow that process. Boeing knows exactly what it's going to take to, to get that um, that amount of effort uh, completed, and it, it's it's a lot of work, uh, but it's it's fully backing WISC in that capacity. So it's a, uh, I think it's it's just the idea. Alex is safest scalable solution. We're not just focused on the technologies of the aircraft, but the whole ecosystem that's required to uh, integrate into the air traffic management safe uh, safely and effectively. Yeah, and I yep. think you guys have some initiatives working in your favor, right? Just looking at what those proposed pilot shortages are between now and, you know, 2030, the, the amount of training that goes into some of these pilots, maintaining those licenses and, and being able to take something simple out, like you said, from point A to point B, that's just a back and forth thing that could potentially be really easy to automate. Um, and then comparing that with what other industries are doing, right? Like, I, I drive a Tesla, it's a Model Y, and I have the autonomous package. So when you're talking about something simple from point A to point B, I'm in the car, not doing something much more complicated. Like we're not 100% there yet, but I'd say the first time I got in the car, you're about to grip the handlebars because you're scared, you know, it's a first time, but the more often you do it and and you see the, the quality and the safety factors that are taken in there, it, it allows you to relax a little bit more and you're a little bit more reliant on it with still those measures in there. Like you said, even with me driving my car in autonomous, I have to hit it every so often to make sure I'm paying attention, you know, so you, you have those safety factors in there. And, and I wouldn't be surprised as we start kind of going down that route, we've seen it in automotive, maybe seeing it in boating, like, is there autonomy between driving certain boats and autopilots there that you could potentially handle, you know, ferries back and forth, something that's point A to point B that goes back and forth as we kind of see this, this shortage of workforce and skilled labor to do some of these jobs. So I, I think that that autonomy of driving different types of vehicles, I think we're going to see expand into a lot of these other industries as well. Yeah, I love that you brought that up, Jessica, because, you know, I think most people have familiarity with autonomous driving and, and it's like kind of that tangible, the closest thing they can relate to. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some really amazing work that's happening in automating um, driving on the road. Uh, I think it's also interesting to know that that problem statement, I believe is much more difficult than what we're talking about. So in the proximity of cars to each other, the fact that uh, the car is making a lot of its decisions with the information it's collecting on its own. So imagine, uh, imagine if all of the roads were provisioned with the ability to talk to the cars and road signs could talk to the cars and the cars were talking to each other uh, and could separate from each other. Uh, imagine how, next level that autonomy would look and feel right and and, and how, now imagine cars are separated by minutes so if you're standing on the corner of a road a busy road how many cars pass by in 20 minutes the operations we're talking about you know you're going to turn airplanes every 15 minutes or so that's nowhere near the density and now you're going into 3d space uh on a in a controlled back and forth route so you know in, in the sense of uh uh, automation of uh, the, the the flying machine versus a uh, an automotive you know the, the automotive solution on on the roads. I think the the car manufacturers are showing us that if it's it, it's it's achievable and the progress we're making on the road and a more difficult problem statement um, that just gives me confidence overall. 
Yeah, it was fascinating to listen to Brian Yuko on that on that podcast, Rami, and you, you could hear the conviction in his voice, like we're hearing in your voice right now about, hey, look, you know, autonomy is not as uh, far out, right, as people may feel or make it seem. So curious, I, I think you used to work for Brian, right, at Boeing before he moved over to uh, WISC, just on a, on a personal note you know, where WISC is and where WISC is trying to go and just kind of like, the, the, you know, the acquisition, the connected tissue. Um, I'm just curious on what your perspective is on, you know, him bringing him, that leadership, the experience of having worked with him, where, where WISC is and where it needs to go. Um, you know, what, what's, what's, what do you feel the roadmap is there? Um, well, so my, my thoughts on, on Brian coming in as the CEO of WISC is absolutely the right leader for WISC. Uh, Brian talks about uh, the importance of confident humility in his podcast. And I think those two words describe him really well. Uh, like you said, I worked for Brian directly uh, when he was at Boeing. Um, it's very special when you can learn from your boss every day. Um, and I do it again in a heartbeat. I, I, I hope to do it again in the future. I think Brian has a way of breaking down you know, complex uh, problem statements into bite-sized chunks. And then he encourages his team to use judgment to, to make sound decisions. Um, and he, he's just hyper-focused on tangible pro uh, progress through uh, test and validation, which you know, it's, that, like that's in my core, <laughs> um, something I also very much believe in and uh, celebrating learning along the way. Um, I, I just think it's very motivational for the, for, for his leadership team and his entire engineering team. I think he also communicates um, often and with joy. Uh, so he's, he's just a remarkable re leader in, in that sense. And uh, I, I, I see that he's unlocking uh, the full potential of an incredible team at WISC, a very talented team. So you combine the talent with the, with the, the leadership. It's just an awesome combo. Um, I also want to give uh, Gary Geisen, uh, a nod to his leadership because I think uh, he was also the right leader for WISC bringing it to this point. Uh, he successfully navigated uh, a very tough period for that we all went through, through the uncertainty of COVID, um, very dynamic times when it comes to um, uh, talent management. And he built, you know, under his watch, the team that, that we're, we're working with today at, uh, at WISC, very, you know, obviously the team that was, was there had to grow. So WISC already started with five generations of successful prototypes and a small team. Now that we get into this uh, manufacturing and certification, we augmented the team substantially. Uh, and, and Gary did a really remarkable job um, uh, bringing WISC there. So both, uh, both leaders have done a great job. We've just, I just feel the momentum um, that, that the team has built. Um, so I'm just all sorts of uh, optimistic. That's, that's awesome. I do have, since you mentioned uh, Gary, you know, and one of the things that I think uh, Boeing did last year, right, was this this ConOps that was a joint uh, ConOps that got put out to the market between or Flight Sciences and Boeing and and um, I think Whisk uh, SkyGrid as well, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, just curious on the feedback you got from that, and if there's been anything that was maybe you you know was unexpected or from the market, and then. You know, I'll, 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 I guess that's a double question, right? Uh, Gary did make headlines last year as he was, you know, stepping down from West saying that, you know, his, his view was that there would only be a handful of these air taxi companies from the hundreds that are on the market today. Um, so just kind of lumping that along with the con ops and how you, you know, your perspective on how you see that con ops shaping out and, you know, the, the forecast for the market in the coming years. Um, okay, great. A couple things there. Um, I'll unpack it. I, uh, I'll start with what I know for sure. And, and that is that uh, advanced air mobility has captured the imagination of countless people. Uh, thousands of engineers are working hard on making what was once a fantasy uh, a reality. And it's attracted top talent from all around the world to come into aerospace um, that may not have been attracted to our industry otherwise. Um, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, the intellectual capital that we're building in this generation of development and exploration uh, as, as this industry is emerging, I think it's growing at an exponential rate. And so regardless of what happens in the competitive landscape, 
those smart people will still be smart and they will still follow their passion. Um, so that that's overall net positive. Uh, companies and businesses live uh, or die by their ability to satisfy their customers and investors. And um, they satisfy the stakeholders by delivering product. Uh, the, the regulators are chartered to ensure that the flying public is as, as safe on this new generation of aircraft as it is uh, flying on an airline. And that's a difficult and capital intensive mission. So some I believe will succeed and some will fail. Um, I think WISC is very fortunate to be in a very in a, in a strong financial uh, position being backed by Boeing. I think Boeing, like I said earlier, knows exactly what it takes to bring a revolutionary form of aviation to market. And it's with WISC focused on doing it right. Um, so I, yeah, I'll, I'll say this too. When, when we get together with peer companies in this domain, uh, there's clearly a mutual respect for each other. You know, we all know that that all the boats will rise with the tide. Our success is good for each other. And I sense a, a respect for this um, safety priority is well understood as being critical to the success of this, this emerging uh, industry, this new form of transportation. So we all know that's important to uh, uh, to all of our success. So those are good things. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, Gary Gary's point is, um, is fair and valid that some some will succeed and some won't. I don't know what the right what the number is going to be, but it's to be expected. Um, but I think in the end, we you know we will see this come to market. There's plenty of there's plenty of demand uh, we believe, and uh, and several several will bring that success. And I think um, your previous just to kind of add to that a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the current CEO was a fantastic leader in the previous. I mean, for me, that's a make or break, right? You have a hundred companies out here. I, I think something that we really see that division of do they make it or not is the leadership team and, and how forward thinking they are, how they're putting these business models in place for some of these startup companies to come in. You know, are they partnering with the right companies? You know, like they partnered with Boeing with you guys. Um, I think that's a really big kind of nugget for people to look at if, if they are moving into some of these spaces um how are they handling that do they have the right leadership team do you have the right business model how how do you make this i don't want to say recession proof but kind of right we went through covid and and whisk was still strong because of those things so um i think those are things they've done very well i, I agree with you jessica yeah i think uh, uh leadership matters so Rami, another, I mean, in your portfolio at Boeing, you know, our understanding is you're, you provide oversight, as uh, Jessica mentioned in the intro, not just to Whisk Arrow, but also for SkyGrid. Can you share for uh, listeners that may be not as familiar with SkyGrid, and we understand, you know, there's a lot of uh, proprietary, still a lot of development, but anything that you can share that's maybe publicly available just to give our listeners an idea of what SkyGrid is about and how it plays into this future vision for air mobility, right? That the Boeing company is, is trying to uh, roll out to the market. Yeah, Alex, you know, you, you touched on our ConOps um, a minute ago, and I think it's important to talk that a little bit so that we can give the mm -hmm. appropriate context for the role yeah. SkyGrid plays. Um, we, we, as you know, we published last year, uh, WISC and Boeing together, uh, and with inputs from SkyGrid and Aurora Flight Sciences, uh, this, our, ver our vision of what this ConOps could look like, this, 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 this how would this uh, uh, self-flying air taxi system work? And the, 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 the feedback we've received was relatively positive. Um, and you can see the, uh, the influence it's had on some of the conversations that are happening industry-wide. So one of, the, one of the important things I think that came out of it was um, aligning on some lexicon, especially when we get into the specific roles of humans in the system. Um, but what, what I'll say is that our, our ConOps describes a deliberately fixed operating environment, which would be uh, uh, intentionally and strategically deconflicting uh, the UAM operations or AAM operations from local air traffic. Um, when we imagine setting up uh, these routes, we're talking about very purposefully researching and limiting the need for any sort of vectoring 
that these specific routes would be predetermined uh, to be essentially out of the way from from our uh, from high traffic areas. And I think the CONOPS has helped the community understand that we're, we're not saying that we need these aircraft to fly wherever they want to fly, that it'll be scoped to, to narrow, thoughtfully defined operating environments. Um, and these operations would be based on what we know today, right? Our IFR, in, instrument flight rules. Um, and every flight is gonna be accompanied by an IFR flight plan. So that, that definition and standards um, is very helpful in understanding that, that concept. Um, the role of the human is also very important to understand on the ground. And what we call this human, one of the humans in the system is a multi-vehicle supervisor. And the supervisor basically provides um, complementary functions uh, interacting with the aircraft and the air traffic management system. And the, basically the MVS or multi-vehicle supervisor is gonna be responsible for the pre-flight planning, um, aircraft uh, operational status, the ATC coordination, and most importantly, using their judgment um, for uh, any contingencies. So there's a there's a there's been a fair and good amount of questions that uh, that our conops generates, and the discussion that's that's coming out of it is like, how do we show um, and solve for multiple vehicle supervision, and how do we demonstrate that it's safer, safer? Um, and I'm really confident in our approach and the process we're taking uh, to do that. But that, this is where we talk about the whole system of systems, that it goes beyond the airplane. Uh, initial operations we're talking about being uh, successful with through your, your basic IFR, but there needs to be steps beyond that when we, when we scale. Um, so the FAA actually just published version two of their CONOPS that describes uh, the concept of automated flight rules or AFR that apply to these UAM corridors, which is basically an evolution of the IFR regime that takes into account uh, advanced communication and automation systems. Uh, and that's the conversation that we're having and is gonna continue. The work to evolve these concepts into a rule set is happening now. Um, and, and we're working hard across many domains, like you mentioned earlier, um, to get consensus on how we implement this is between OEMs, NASA, Regulator, the regulators, um, uh, research institutes. Uh, so it's it's a lot of smart people um, thinking about this. But the bottom line is we, we've got to converge on the solution set that limits the need for vectoring based on that reliable and predictable tra uh, uh, traffic management uh, in the sector. Um, but we still need to maintain the ability to vector if required. And that's where um, your multi-vehicle supervisor comes into play. So how do they get the information and the data they need? Um, that's where that's where SkyGrid comes in. The, this this concept called a, a PSU provider of services for UAM. And uh, I wanted to address your comment about AI uh, 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 about about SkyGrid before we get into the specifics. But AI uh, is is one of those terms, artificial intelligence, that that has a wide spectrum of meaning, just like autonomy. I don't love it, um, but it, you know, it could be envisioned as something like a Skynet when we talk about the, the whole thing. But I want to be, it's very important that we're super clear about certification standards. By definition, anything that's safety critical has to be fully deterministic. That means you, you have to have the same thing happen as an output every single time you make that same input. That makes the logic and behavior of whatever function reliable and certain. That's important to remember in any part of the system. So relative to AI, there, there's opportunity to help with things like operational efficiency and fleet management, but it will not play a role in making decisions for where the aircraft goes or what it does by, by definition. So I think that's really important to make clear. SkyGrid um, exists today as a company focused on integrating small UAS, uh, uncrewed aircraft systems, and the low altitude airspace so that remote pilots can operate um, their drones like DJIs safely, efficiently, legally within the system. Um, and it, it powers thousands of small UAS flights. Um, the difference though, between uh, vehicle certification and operational approval is gonna be a very, very important focus point here coming. And this is the reason we have SkyGrid as an operational enabler to ensure the problem is solved holistically. 
Um, as airplane people, we tend to bias our focus to aircraft systems, but the broader airspace management system is equally important to address. And, and an integrated airspace uh, approach that builds on that commercial safety assurance levels I talked about with WISC is really crucial um, to enabling the skilled operations. So SkyGrid is, is maturing our operations now to being that third-party service provider of certified autonomy uh, functions. Uh, next step in this vision is for SkyGrid to basically become the world's most trusted provider of certified autonomous functions that integrate uncrewed aircraft into the global airspace. That's what we're doing through SkyGrid. Makes sense. There's, uh, you know, as, as you've mentioned, and you touched on Rami already on multiple times, right? There's uh, the public perception to safety and yeah, it's, it's everything, right? I mean, it just takes one incident or something to go wrong. And so... With that, um, you know, we'll ask you a similar question that we've asked previous guests on this uh, show is, you know, tech, there's so much tech investment that's coming into the industry. And, you know, the, the tech industry ethos is move fast and break things, right? You got to move fast and break things, move fast and break things. And I think, you know, folks are finding out that, hey, look, aerospace doesn't work this way. Um, curious what your perspective is on that mindset is there's more and more tech uh, kind of influence, if you will, or innovation coming into the industry and kind of finding that that safety record, which you, um, you know, rightfully have pointed out to, you know, a lot of this innovation and, you know, uncharted waters we're really heading into as, as an industry, right? Oh, I love, I love this question. And uh, maybe I'm, I'm weird, but I'm not dissuaded by the move fast and break things mantra. Uh, I'll give you my take. I'm a test engineer by trade, right? Uh, I, I don't view that phrase as the end state. Uh, you know, we're not going to break things with people, but I think it describes a process of rapid learning, uh, which I'm all about. I think during product development, um, we make many engineering assumptions in several domains that need to come together. Um, have you ever seen that cartoon where you have uh, all the various engineers have designed the airplane from their only their perspective, like the aeronautical engineer, the aerodynamics engineer, designs basically just a wing. The propulsion engineer has this giant engine with two little stubby wings. The structure is basically designed an I-beam for the airplane. It's obviously tongue in cheek, but all of those things are important, but they need to come together to create the system. And in today's world, in today's digital world, we're able to mature these designs via modeling and simulation very quickly. And we can validate um, software in, in our digital twins. We can use virtual machines that emulate hardware before it exists. Um, but nothing replaces the moment where it all comes together uh, on the thing you're building. And the faster the teams can do um, to get to that integrated testing, the faster they mature their design. So in, in aerospace, I think we can, we can develop rapidly and still hold ourselves accountable to the highest standards of safety uh, as the end state. The process of getting there, move fast and break things uh, without hurting people, of course, uh, I think is, is great. Safety, safety parameters are there as, uh, as design parameters that cannot be bent. Uh, and I think the move fast and break things describes like a spiral design where you, you learn quickly by doing and evolve your design incrementally. So I think it's a false, false dichotomy to think of innovation and safety as opposing poles. I, like I said earlier, I think it's an and, not an or. It's the, cri it's the criteria that helps us keep innovating. And I think that's a, that's a constant R&D, right? Like we're getting into vertical flight. We're getting into autonomous aircraft. Like how long ago is someone sitting around like, it'd be really cool if that just took off by itself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a fascinating perspective, Rami. Thank you so much for that. Um, so that we'll take this moment to transition to our are ready for landing uh, takeaways. So I guess our, our first one, just to kind of summarize, uh, this is a fantastic, fascinating episode running. Uh, aerospace is on the cusp of a technological revolution that will make aerial air travel uh, available to the majority of civilization, but it's gonna require diversity, innovation, and collaborative ecosystems across the industry and around the globe. Um,
And then companies such as Whisk Arrow and SkyGrid are paving the way for this next generation transportation system and one that's going to foster safety, sustainability, and affordability within our communities. And thank you so much for sharing all of that insight today, Rami. Was it extremely, for me personally, insightful? And I'm sure for our listeners that maybe weren't as familiar with Whisk and SkyGrid and the work you and the team at Boeing are doing, it's, it's really fascinating. And then if you don't mind taking us away with the last one, Rami, I think this is, uh, you know, just kind of put the, the point on the, the work that you and the team at Boeing are doing. Oh, you bet, Alex. Hey, thanks. Uh, th this is great. As innovators, leaders, and enthusiasts of this next generation of uh, transportation system, Boeing is building on a proven 100-year history of aviation successes of the past uh, to advance the highest safety standards into the future. Uh, I, I love that statement. I agree with it. Uh, we're We're creating aviation 3.0, um, but it doesn't happen unless we lead with safety. It's the, the criteria that cannot waver. Um, so commercial levels of safety goes beyond the aircraft. It's a holistic system. That's what brings the accessibility to of, uh, of aerospace and aircraft to more people around the globe. Um, and I'm just so thrilled to be part of it. I'm thrilled for the opportunity to talk to you about it today. Alex and Jessica, thanks for the chance. Awesome. Thank you. I think that wraps us up for this episode. Thank you so much, Remy, for sharing both your industry thought leadership and Boeing's exciting journey with Whisk Arrow and SkyGrid. And for everyone else kind of tuned in, uh, please join us next month as we explore today's dynamic industry with distinguished visionaries such as Remy today, our next set of change makers, policy creators, and those innovative ideas that are cultivating our new frontiers across aviation, space, and defense. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time.